All right, welcome everyone. It's time to do it. Uh, I told you in our last video, I might do a another video or two. It, it depended on, and I decided, yeah, we need to do one. And I wanted to kind of do an overview of what all that we talked about, because I know that it's easy to get lost in the details, right? And it's rare if we can see it from a 45,000 feet uh, view from the sky, so to speak. And I just want to remind everyone, please, uh, I would love for you to get this uh, book. It's free, and it talks about uh, the truth, my friends, that there are errors in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, and it's not from God. And I love Mormons, and Larry, I love Larry Saints enough to tell them the truth and want them to come to know the true Jesus. Uh, but anyways, I want to kind of give an overview of the spalding Rigdon theory, and that's what we're going to do. So let's get to it. So... Remember, the Book of Mormon, actually, it was uh, published in 1830, March. And so you can see how uh, it's it's so interesting that it actually comes in the right cultural context, because this is what early Americans believed. They believed that the Indian Indians' uh, ancestors were the Israelites who came here. And uh, James Adair, William Penn, and many others believe this. Now it's not. It's interesting that the Spalding really Rigdon theory kind of really starts to hit off, so to speak, in Conuit, Ohio, where Solomon Spalding once lived. So in February of 1832, we have Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith. Their missionaries are going on their journey, doing their missionary work. They happen to stop by Conuit, Ohio, and they and Orson Hyde was doing the preaching. And there was something familiar about what he said in, to those audience who knew, once knew Solomon Spalding, who had read his manuscript to those who were there nearly uh, from 1809 to 1812 in that vicinity. And so it's so interesting to see that what happened was they, some of them did remember the writings, they said that the Book of Mormon sounds like Solomon Spalding's writings, and this was particularly Nehemiah King, whom we'll mention later, but there might have been some others who also uh, believe that. So we know that Solomon Spalding, he once lived there in Conuet from 1809 to 1812. Now what's interesting is that one year before, um, one year before, um, Samuel Smith and, and uh, Orson Hyde. It's February 15, 1831, is that the Cleveland Advertiser had uh, had talked about, very interesting enough, Sig uh, well, I'll, t I'll talk about Sidney Rigdon, that he was somehow in relationship to the Book of Mormon, which is very interesting. So it's interesting that the group in Conuit identifies Solomon Spalding as the author with the Book of Mormon, but in 1831, the Cleveland Advertiser identified Sidney Rigdon with the Book of Mormon, and then James Gordon Bennett, who did his research, he uh, was in up in New York, and somehow he came across information. Uh, August 7th, he wrote in his diary that it was Sidney Rigdon who was the author of the Mormon Bible. And then 30, August 31st and September 1st, there was a two-part article, and it basically talked about how Sidney Rigdon was basically, probably, uh, it was most likely, it doesn't mention Oliver Cowdery, but Oliver Cowdery probably is the one who was the mediator between, um, between Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith. And so it's interesting that those two different independent groups uh, uh, identify Rigdon, but then the other one identifies Solomon Spalding. And then, so in 1833, um, Hulbert had been converted to the LDS church and uh, he was doing his missionary activity and probably somewhere around mid-April, most likely, it's where he started to hear about Solomon Spalding and that he had written a book. We're not sure exactly of everything about that, though. Then... Uh, he may have heard it from a man named Jackson, because that's what Benjamin Winchester reports in his book. But Jackson may have told uh, Holbert, told Holbert to go see John and Martha Spalding, which is the brother and 
wife, um, brother's wife, Martha, John and Martha Spalding. And this was in Conewetville, Pennsylvania. So this was in August of 18. Well, it, I can't say August. Yep. It was the summer of 1833 because we it's, there's no date given. I'm sorry. So then John Martha Spalding must have told, Hey, you need to go see these men in Conuet because that's where Solomon Spalding would either have read his manuscript to these people or they had read it themselves. So he visited Aaron Wright, Nahum Howard, Oliver Cal- uh, sorry, Oliver Smith, and that's August of 1833 because that's on the affidavits. And then we see how Hulbert went to Mentor, Ohio to get a committee to sponsor him. And then... Um, they, then he went to Artemis Cunningham, uh, others. He went to Henry Lake, who lived in Conuet, and also John Miller, who lived in Conuet, I believe, or somewhere close to there. But he also went to visit Artemis Cunningham, who lived uh, in, like, Giaga County or something like that, I believe. So that was September of 1833. Uh, and then um, the committee was able to sponsor him to go to uh, visit Matilda Davidson, which was the widow of Solomon Spalling. So he did so. He traveled there. He got to her doorsteps in Monson, Massachusetts, uh, November 22nd, 1833. And the daughter was there, of course, as well. Um, basically, Matilda told him to go to, I think it was Hartwick, New York, if I remember correctly, to go to the trunk and open up, um, allow the, give uh, the, basically to get the approval to open up the trunk. So he opened up the trunk and he, he was able to find the manuscript called Manuscript Story, Conuet Creek. Then uh, we see, interesting enough, he says that uh, this is finally where Halbert realizes that Rigdon is somehow involved because he must have heard from the widow that Rigdon was involved. And so Pomeroy Tucker writes in December 20th, 1833, uh, that it was believed to be the notorious Rigdon, he said. So Hulbert um, must have heard of that from Matilda Davidson. Uh, then, so that now you can see how there's the connection now, basically, between uh, Solomon Spalding and Sidney Rigdon. Now, going a bit further, we know, interesting enough, there was a main man named James Briggs, and it's interesting to read his affidavits. And interesting, he said that Hulbert had also given them manuscript found, the committee to look, look at, and they examined many chapters, he said, and they were able to see that they were identical. Um, but what's interesting is we, we don't know what happened to manuscript found. That's what's sad. And it's sadly said that may maybe that Hulbert sold it to uh, he sold it to the Mormons. But let me let me say this first. We know that um, Hulbert, what he did was he went to um, so he might have went to the committee. I think he may have went to the committee and they they looked at it, the the manuscript. But then then Hulbert decided to go to see Aaron Wright. And we know that he Aaron Wright. I mean, he not only visited Aaron Wright, he probably visited some of the others, but we know he did visit Aaron Wright because we have Wright's undrafted letter, and this is December of 1833. And it's very important that he says uh, two things, actually. Wright says that uh, Hulbert showed him manuscript story, and he said that's not the same same story. It's not manuscript found. Uh, Hulbert, I mean, uh, Wright says that he went back, Spalding went back further in dates and, and changed his gears, so to speak, um, so that's something to think about. Um, he probably also visited, um, uh, uh, Wright also talked about another piece of evidence, which was Hyde. Hyde was the one who came to Conuit in 1832 and talked about Solomon Spalding's writings. I mean, sorry, he talked about the Book of Mormon and they identified that as Solomon Spalding's writings. And it, he identifies Nehemiah King and sadly Nehemiah King had died by this time. So they weren't, that's why they weren't able to secure a, uh, an affidavit from him. Uh, then Hulbert went to see E.D. Howe uh, in Painesville, Ohio. Uh, and what he did was um, he gave he gave E.D. Howe uh, all the statements there in green, 
Amy Wright, Nathan Howard, Oliver Smith, Henry Lake, John Miller, Artemis Cunningham, John and Martha Spalding. So he gave those. And then uh, he also gave Edie Howell um, the, um, the manuscript story. He gave him that book as well, that manuscript. And then Edie Howe actually says that he went to visit the uh, witnesses themselves before he published his book in 1834, November 1834. He says he found them to be respectable and found them to be honest men. Uh, this, so then he writes in his book, and he writes, he puts all this information in the November 1834 in Mormonism unveiled. Then what, what about manuscript found? Well, that's the question, right? Uh, that's 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 the enigma, unfortunately. But we also know that Oliver later on uh, in 1884, when the first um, story was discovered in Honolulu, Hawaii, that they found this also on the manuscript there. That these are the writings of Solomon Spalding; they're genuine, and it has Oliver Smith, John Miller, and Aaron Wright on it. So it's obvious that. And, and, and others. So it's obvious that um, Hulbert went to see Oliver Smith and John Miller as well. We also see uh, there are other people who did um, say that the conuit witnesses, we call them the conuit witnesses, those in the green, uh, that they were highly respectable people who were honest about what they that we would say. So you got Jesse J. Moss, for example, he wrote about, he, he couldn't remember the person's name, but it's obvious he's talking about Aaron Wright. Uh, and then there's James Barr Walker. Um, James Barr was, I believe, talking about John Miller. And then you have Hiram Lake, the son of uh, Henry Lake. You got uh, Lauren Gold, uh, Daniel Bacon, John Hall, John Brown, uh, Edward, uh, Payne, Gibson, Crane, Kayaz, uh, Jackson, who was the son of, of what we'll see as another witness to be soon, to be seen soon. T.B. Howard, uh, Anna, H., uh, which was uh, Nahum Howard's son. A Anna H. Taking, which was uh, daughter of Oliver Smith and E.B. Haskell. But there were also others who came along. Uh, Robert Harper, uh, well, through through secondhand H. Hollis, then Daniel Spencer, William Leffingwell, and Cephas Dodd, who said that Spalding did write manuscript found. Then the connection between Solomon Spalding and Sidney Rigdon is that Matilda Davidson says that uh, Rigdon had taken his manuscript, Joseph Miller, and Reddick McKee. Uh, Matilda McKinstry, she just she talks about um, how saw her dad wrote um, her dad wrote manuscript found and remembers some of the characters' names. Uh, there's also Abner Jackson who also remembers the manuscript found. And then there's also Josiah Spalding, but Josiah Spalding was he was remembering the first manuscript, but he also remembered he couldn't remember Rigdon's name, but he did say that there was a person who became a leading Mormon who followed. Uh, the Spaldings when they were in Pittsburgh. And there's Robert Patterson Sr., who was the printer there, and he, he all he remembered really was a man from the East came and basically dealt with um, with Silas Ingalls, and, uh, who was working there in the publishing firm. Uh, then you have these people here, Rebecca Eichbaum, who worked in the post office. She said that she remembers Signe Rigdon and... and um, uh, Solomon Spalding. What's interesting is there is a list in 1816 with Solomon Spalding and Sidney Rigdon's name on the list to go come get their mail. Uh, there's John Winter, and this um, you can read about more like these. Amarillo Dunlap, Dency Thompson, um, Harvey Baldwin, Deacon Clapp, Ann Redfield, C. E. Henry, G. B. Frost, Arthur W. Alderman, John C. Bennett, James Jeffrey. Um, some are stronger than others, and some are pretty weak. But they mention that <coughs> that Sidney Rigdon had taken the manuscript. You also have then, because um, it was only in June, uh, I think June 1829, if I remember correctly, when the newspaper accounts started talking about the Book of Mormon. But Joseph Smith, I mean, Sidney Rigdon had been 
talking about the a book coming out even before June 1829. And obviously, some of these apply to that, but not all of them. Um, Adamson Bentley, Alexander Campbell, Darwin Atwater, Thomas Clapp, John Rudolph, I'm going to be, gr be green, S.W. Hansen, Stephen Hart, uh, Reddick, Reuben B. Harmon, and Samuel F. Whitney. Now, not all of them talk about how um, some talk about, you know, Sidney Rigdon talked about a new religion coming. Sidney Rigdon talked about um, these mounds and something spectacular was going to happen. So I just want to mention those that you can look up again. Then you have the connection between Rigdon and Joseph Smith Jr. In that um, there was, uh, now some of these are weak, but some, some are a little strong. So Erasmus uh, that said they saw Joseph Smith and Rigdon before his conversion in November of 1830. So there's Erasmus Turner, Pomeroy Tucker, Abel Chase, Anna Eaton, Emily Coburn, S.F. Anderwick, W.A. Lilly, Lorenzo Saunders. So it's very interesting to read their testimonies, and I would urge you to do so. Some are weak, but uh, a little. some are a little stronger. And it definitely talks about how they can fit into some of the window gaps where Rigdon would have been gone from Ohio to New York and could have gotten back in time. Uh, so very interesting. Then you have Solomon Spalding. Uh, if you look at his description of who he was, he had war experience because he served in the Revolutionary War. He had a law education because he served under uh, he was he was under Zephaniah Swift for a little bit. Class he had attained a classics education at Dartmouth. He had curiosity about first inhabitants uh, because he worked uh, near the mounds and just probably got his imagination sparked because of what he what he saw. He, had, he definitely have a biblical knowledge because he went into the divinity, got a divinity degree. Um, he wrote in the old style. He was called Old Come to Pass because he wrote, and it came to pass is what they said a lot in his book. And he had the ability to write, obviously, because of Manuscript Story, Conuit Creek. Now, interesting things about uh, Manuscript Story is that it is a different title from Manuscript Found, right? It uh, is about the Romans coming to America. Or they, they're, you know, they, well... Uh, they get blown off to course, basically, and, and they come to America. It's uh, ne it's a story that was never finished, my friends. In fact, it has missing pages. It's abrupt endings. It's not fit for publication. And it was probably stopped near the beginning of 1812. So it from what Aaron Wright and others had said, he started it again. And this time, uh, he you know, he instead of doing it for amusement, he really wanted to make a profit. So... Obviously, he's probably going to try to do a better job. So it's a different title, Manuscript Found, obviously. Lost, talking about the lost tribes of Israel who, who journeyed to America. It's, and it obviously was fit for publication because you see them talk about that he needed security money in order to pay for the printing, but he did not, unfortunately, have it. And he probably started this novel near the beginning of 1812, and it's in the autumn of 1812 when he went of uh, journeyed to Pittsburgh to try to have it published. Um, he also, um, uh, you can see that the witnesses, they talk about these details, historical novel, first settlers of America, descendants of American Indians, journey from Jerusalem, judgment of the, on the old world, uh, Nephi, Lehi, Mormon, Moroni, the characters, uh, quarrels and contentions separated into two nations, Lamanites and Nephites, bloody wars, arts and sciences, and a king to pass, they said, is found many times. No religious matter, old obsolete style, like King James Version type style, I, Nephi, uh, account of Laban is mentioned, which is actually in first Nephi. There's a red mark on foreheads mentioned by Joseph Miller. There's the Straits of Darien where they would have uh, gotten to, which is up near Panama. There's the humorous passages mentioned by John Miller. And there's the record hidden in the earth. And friends, that fits manuscript found. Um, but the no religious matter, that was because Signe Rigdon is the one who added the theological material to it. He added it to manuscript found. And so Rigdon, he loved to read. He believed he was called of God. He was devoted to the study of the Bible, deceptive because he made up his conversion experience, he said. He was an orator. Um, his character just wasn't all that it ought to be. Uh, he was a Bible scholar, different mood swings. Sometimes he was uh, a on a high of mood swing, but also he was very uh, low. He would thought of himself as a prophet. He could easily make up a, uh, something akin to scripture, uh, like the third Peter, for example. 
the satire that he made. Then we have Spalding's fingerprints from Manuscript Story um, that we can look at and kind of see. Uh, so that would be the right cultural context, like we've already talked about, that there are books already being written about this. There's parallel themes, I believe, between Manuscript Story and the Book of Mormon that you can look at with J James E. Bales and the other two. Um, there is word parallels that are talked about, character names. You know, interesting that, you know, the word pattern, the pattern's there, but yet I know there's different character names in the Book of Mormon. Uh, so character names share unique word patterns. There's indecision. You can look at those if you... And a king of pass definitely is the, is a difference because there's no end to king of pass found in the manuscript story. Frequently used words uh, that were that were done by Criddle's group, unique words by Spalling also, uh, Criddle's group that who did. And you gotta remember that Rigdon met Alexander Campbell in 1821 with Adams and Bentley, and there they took up the the reform uh, the what well, they call it the Reformation cause during that time, but they also we we call it today the Restoration movement. So he took upon himself the restoration principle. Now we talked about the restoration principle and I don't have time to put all that into the, its proper context, but Rigdon took it to the extreme. He tried to say, Hey, we need to have miraculous gifts in the, but that was temporary friends. That was unique to the first century AD. So Rigdon's fingerprints would have been it that the book of Mormon endorses Rigdon's theological views like the miraculous gifts and so forth, like commun communal living, Book of Mormon contains lots of biblical passages, and we see that. You can see my book for this. It contains the adopted views of the American Restoration Movement, although I would argue that those are found in the Bible all along. Uh, then there's a signature phrase, children of men, that's used. It contains the former theological views. Uh, it contains his Baptist views on salvation before he found the truth in March 1828, in which, when the 116 pages crisis occurred, then he added those new views, which sadly, we'll, we, as we see, leads, well, uh, we see it, not, well, it's not sadly, it's, um, we know that it does lead to contradictions. And that's how we can know that this book could not have come from God. And so when you put all of it together, friends, you have Spalding's fingerprints, you have Rigdon's fingerprints, and then you have the details that the witnesses mention. And sure enough, um, you have Rigdon who had the opportunity to take the manuscript and make it into what he needed it to become. And I believe you have the Book of Mormon. Well, I hope that helps you very much. Um, and I hope that you can see that, uh, that I care for your soul very much. We love you so much, and we want you to come to the knowledge of the truth. Put away, put away this the Book of Mormon. Let's get back to what the Bible teaches, my friends. Let's go back to what the Bible says, and 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 love Jesus, and love the true Jesus, and love the the true Church that He established, and become a part of it. I love to study with you. I hope you'll want to. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I really appreciate it.